a hard time standing behind a microphone at a podium. Uh, I spent many years teaching and I found out it was a harder pursuit to hit a moving target. So <laughs> move around. If you can hear me, um, that's good. If you can't, and I really need to, I will move over behind the, uh, behind the podium. Can you hear me well enough? All yes. Over? yes. Okay. First off, again, since I spent many years teaching, um, every teacher has to have handouts. So I brought two handouts from my old teaching files. I've been going through my old teaching files and digging out stuff going, this was great. Wow, really, I, this is, they must have loved this, and I don't know that they did, but um, I've got two things that really struck me, and they've got nothing to do with our topic tonight, but it may be something that interests you. Uh, one of them, I'll pass them around, and there's plenty of copies, so you just grab a copy and uh, go get them. One of them, if you read Parade Magazine, you may be familiar with Maryland's most seven. Um, probably got the highest IQ of anybody who's been recorded, written a column for years. And she wrote a column years ago um, as a response to a letter from a first year high school history teacher saying his students constantly asked him, why do we have to study history? And if you ever talk history or talk history or talk it to anybody, that question always comes up sooner or later. Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to study history? <laughs> <laughs> we, we historians, it was, yeah, it was algebra, chemistry, science, all that kind of stuff. But for most ordinary students. So anyway, she came with a brilliant, what I think is a brilliant answer befitting her brilliant IQ. So uh, I kind of thought it was fun. So if you want to pass that around. Uh, wherever they want that back in the back, just collect any leftovers, and I'll appreciate it. The other one is written in 2001 which is practically prehistoric times in student years, <laughs> written in 2001, and it was editorial. The title of the editorial, this is again back when we were just getting into Afghanistan, which 20 years later we finally got now, for better or for worse. But the editorial, or uh, was an editorial written, quote, to the Afghans, a few of our favorite things. And the editorial was about if you really want to change Afghanistan and those people and their lives, um, you don't drop bombs on them and send guns and soldiers and whatever. You send them a few of our favorite things and list some of the favorite things, uh, including, if you remember, the um, Ken Burns Civil War thing. Uh, so send them a copy of Sullivan Ballou's letter. I don't know if you remember Sullivan Ballou's letter, but that's there. Um, part of the um, just clips from movies, clips from this, Martin Luther King speech, just stuff that this editorial argues represent America far better than guns and bullets and bombs and things like that. Um, I thought it was interesting, and uh, I used to challenge my students how many of these have you ever heard of, and most of them they hadn't heard of, and the rest of them they didn't hear about. So, <laughs> typical students. Okay, when Tommy called and asked me to speak uh, to you all tonight. Um, I said, this is great. I've got several topics. I can talk on this, I can talk on that. And he said, well, no, no, we can talk on Native Americans. And if I slip out and call him again, please uh, bear with me. I don't mean it as an insulting or demeaning term. Speaking as someone who grew up for a lot of years using the term Indians. Um, so if I slip out, please, I hope you don't take offense. But anyway, so he said, now I need to speak on and Native Americans. And at the time, I had recently published an article on Fauna Parker in Wild West Magazine. And so that was what I decided to focus on. But then I saw the article in the newspaper about you all recently dedicated the, uh, what is it called? 
It's a peace circle. Yes. Yeah. Then it pays tribute to American Indians and the American Indian Treaty, the peace circle. And that made me think, we'll get there, we'll get the quad, we should pay, we'll get there. <laughs> um, but it made me think about something, and that is, we have two statues in the historic Fort Worth stockyards. Two statues. You know what they are? Simon's Cowboy. Anna Parker and Bill Pickett. Yep. Oh. Quanta Parker, obviously Native American. Bill Pickett was a black cowboy. Uh, made himself a star and rodeo as a bulldog. Mm -hmm. Neither Bill Pickett nor Quanta Parker was born in Fort Worth, or grew up in Fort Worth, or lived in Fort Worth, or died in Fort Worth. So why do we have statues to them in the Fort Worth historic stockyards? You're free students. Can you jump in here? <laughs> or not. Somebody thought it's a good idea. Ah, <laughs> uh -huh. he lived with the uh, bulldog. I mean, what, when he was bulldog. Yeah, yeah. Bill Pickett was famous as a uh, bulldog with his own technique, which we don't need to get into right now. If you want to come ask uh, either me or Tommy later. But uh, you need two things to put up a statue. One is somebody has to take a very deep and abiding interest in the subject of that statue. And secondly, come on people, secondly, money. 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 Somebody has to be willing to write the check to write the cost of putting up the statue. You don't have the abiding interest, you don't have the money, it doesn't matter how famous a person is, you ain't going to have a statue. We spent years trying to get a statue to Ripley Arbor put up in Fort Worth. And we stumbled into one problem, one issue, one thing after another. Um, we finally got it, we being, I was just on the, on the periphery, but finally got it by approaching uh, the Coors distributor people, family, and uh, they wrote the check to do it. And um, don't even ask about the connection between the Coors beer distributorship people and the Statue of Ripley Arnold, but it took that, finally. A lot of us wanted it, but couldn't write the check. We are still trying to get a statue. Fort Worth has no statue to General William Jenkins' work. Hmm. Fort Worth has no statue to General Edward Tarrant. And because of a recent change in uh, sentiments, political sentiments, political feelings, uh, the chances of getting a statue to General Edward Tarrant are pretty slim now because Tarrant was a slave owner. And it's even harder to get a statue put up to a slave owner. Um, Ripley Arnold also had a slave, nobody knew about it, so um, we got him, we got him by. But it leads to a question, uh, and then we're getting there, we're getting there, but it leads to a question, which is, we're in the process of putting up new statues. You all just put up the peace circle. And don't hold up your hand, this is a rhetorical statement, but I doubt if there's a single Native American in the room and grapevine, maybe there is, and if there is, I don't mean it to insult you, but I'm sure grapevine is not predominantly Native American, but you just spent, somebody spent a lot of money to put up these statues, and it had to be for a reason. And we're busy putting up statues, and we're equally busy tearing down statues. Um, all those Confederate heroes that uh, people our age grew up adoring and loving, uh, I used to, when I used to go to Sunday school at Westbury Church of Christ uh, in the eighth grade, we used to have cards we filled out for our attendance cards. I signed my card Robert E. Lee every Sunday. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea why, I just got Robert E. Lee every Sunday. Uh, that's how I was supporting the Sunday school books. But anyway, but, but we're busy tearing down statues and putting up statues, and you have to ask, even if you're not the one writing the checks, why? What is it about? certain people that they're now no longer worthy. Um, there was in, we'll get there, but there was in front of the Tarrant County Courthouse since 1953, a big granny marker. And the marker was dedicated to Confederate veterans and their descendants who fought in the Spanish-American War, World War I, and World War II. And the marker, granny marker, one of them, four or five markers on the Tarrant County Courthouse lawn was put up by the United Daughters of the Confederacy in 1953. And I used to do tours of the courthouse lawn and I'd tell people, here you've got four markers, run around and look at them, um, see which one is politically incorrect. And 
Nobody got it. Uh, my young students, my older people, they, they all went good. One is to TCU, which that may be politically incorrect if Patterson keeps losing games. One is to TCU. <laughs> one is to firefighters. And who could possibly protest a marker monument dedicated to firefighters? A third one is to MIAs. Missing in action, not just Vietnam, but it's our soldier, MIAs. Nobody could protest that. And I showed them the statue dedicated to all these veterans who fought the wars. I said, what's wrong with that? This is veterans who fought the Spanish-American War, uh, World War I, World War II. What's wrong with that? And they go, well, that sounds good to me. But it begins with Confederate veterans and their ancestors who fought in these other wars. You get down to the bottom, it's put up by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. That marker is no longer there. Um, about a year ago, um, there was a lot of protests, and the county commissioners decided to whisk it away, and they didn't exactly do it in the dark of night, but um, one day it was there, one day it was gone. And there for several months, it was just a, a spot in the grass of, of dirt, and it's gone. Now, where it lines up now, uh, nobody knows it's officially in storage. Now, I'm not saying that to stir up your anger or your political feelings or get half of you to say good riddance and happy to say the hell with them. I'm saying that because we look at, we need to look at, why do we put up statues, memorials, uh, monuments, and why do we tear them down? And what's the purpose? What's the point? And I think as a historical society, it just put up a statue or the, the peace circle to Native Americans, maybe it's something that the people of Grapevine might ask. Um, hopefully, if you ask, you engage in a civil conversation. We don't do that much anymore. If I'm right and you're wrong, I'm going to punch your lights out and call you a dirty name and uh, kick you in the shin if you don't do it to me first. Maybe we can engage in a civil conversation. So all that is what came up to me as I was thinking about Quanta Parker. I'm talking about Quanta Parker. And I saw the newspaper story about the peace circle, and then I realized why Tom was saying, no, 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 Rick, the subject needs to be Native Americans. Something about Native Americans. And I finally understood it. So let's look at Quanta Parker. You came to hear Quanta Parker, and finally we're to Quanta Parker. Um, the most photographed Native American in history, in American history. Uh, more than Geronimo, more than Sitting Bull, Quanta Parker, the most photographed Native American in history. Um, Again, my favorite question of why? Why? Obviously, he wasn't camera shy. Uh, the man never met a camera he didn't like. And there are so many pictures out there. This particular article in Wild West Magazine, I set out with a friend uh, who is much more connected to the Comanche Nation than I am to try to dig the pictures to tell when this was taken. Because if you look at Quanta Parker pictures, there's a bunch of them. But you can only date them by looking at the setting or looking at how he, how he aged and stuff like that. And the case of Quanta Parker, Woody, the man never met Botox and didn't need it, but <laughs> he had those chiseled Indian, pardon me, Indian, mm -hmm. chiseled good looks right up to his last years. Uh, if you look at some of the Indian chiefs that were photographed late in life, they were stooped over, they were old, they were tired looking, and Quanta Parker, uh, would develop a little bit of a tummy in later pictures, but he always was erect and proud, and he always, always, always wore braids. He always wore his Indian braids. Now, what he did do, and I want you to look at it, we'll get to the pictures, but what he did do is he was a man of uh, many, uh, many faces, many appearances, and the fact that you had Quanta Parker, the Comanche Indian chief. And his role, his title as Comanche Indian Chief was bestowed on him after the Comanche surrender and went on the reservation. It was given to him by the U.S. government. In Comanche Indian culture, if you're not at war, you don't get a war chief. Um, but the U.S. government said, you, you're Brother Quanta, whatever your name is, you represent all the Comanche on the reservation. And that created some problems, some conflicts for Quanta. So uh, that, was, that was one of the things was a problem. Um, never met a camera, he was Comanche chief, at least proclaimed, and he was, the old-fashioned, in the correct term, is half-blood. Um, he was half-white, <coughs> and again, I'm getting us all politically incorrect, and I hope I don't offend you, but half-Comanche or half-Native American, because his mother, Cynthia Ann Parker, um, was captured by the Comanche, and when the Comanche captured young girls, 
the attendant to um, take him with wives. And we don't want to get too deep into the weeds, but not necessarily wives where you stand before a preacher and say, I do, and put a ring on and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you belong, if you're captured, you belong to him. And she was um, the wife of the Comanche chief and gave birth to children. So, Fauna Parker, just a, a fascinating person. Um, again, he aged remarkably well. That's what I was saying. Um, he had his native Comanche chief guard. He paid several visits uh, to Fort Worth. Um, he was friends with cattlemen like Bert Burnett and W.T. Wagner. And the reason they were friends was because Fauna leased Comanche reservation property to them for their herds. So they liked him as long as they got really cheap grazing land from the Comanche Nation, which was granted by Quana without consulting necessarily the other Indian leaders, and that created us a problem. But something about him in Fort Worth. And he came to various events in Fort Worth. When he was here, they put him up in a hotel. Uh, he was in the back of the hotel because he was still an Indian. He was an Indian chief, and they needed his goodwill. But when he came, he wore his Comanche costume, and he looked very Indian, not cigar store, but very fierce Comanche Indian. Other times he wore a business suit. And he could wear a business suit just as well as he could wear a Comanche garb to fit it. When he traveled by train to various places, when he went to Washington, D.C., he was dressed in a white man's clothes, just like any other white man riding a train to go into Washington, D.C. So he could move back and forth. In fact, one of the things about Quanta that we've always said, those of us who are interested in him, is he had the ability to have a foot in both worlds and both cultures. He could move and talk and get along and make business here with whites, but he could also move in the Comanche world. So with all that said, what would you ask for? Um, here is the opening of the article in Wild West magazine. It came out, uh, came out in maybe in August, I think anyway. Um, but this was going to be the opening of the editorial chronology of Fonda Parker. And let's move forward, number one, the next one. Richard, can I ask just a quick question about yes. what you said? Did, did, did Cynthia and Grayson speak English? Did you like English talk about? Oh, hold that question. I'm going to try to answer that. Okay. Uh, a lot of what we know or think we know about Quanta and Cynthia Ann is a very, very little bit of facts and a lot of extrapolation, elaborate, elaboration, whatever. Uh, we didn't know him until he was a full-grown man and a Comanche warrior, and he made very successful war on settlers in the U.S. cavalry for years. And uh, when he finally came in willingly to the reservation, he never really talked about I was raised this way. The Indians didn't do that. Um, you know how we tell everybody I was raised and then I went to the first grade and then my mother did this? And they, didn't, they didn't do that. It didn't matter who your mother was. So we're not really sure. Um, somewhere along the way, we learned to speak English. Somewhere along the way. And depending upon which stories you read, some of the newspaper stories have him giving these most eloquent speeches. You're going to go, darn, man, the same guy wrote his speech who must have written Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. It's brilliant. It's eloquent. And you get the feeling that maybe this is the newspaper reporter's translation of um, Fauna maybe broken in English. Um, but it, again, that's guesswork. This picture right here, Cynthia Ann Parker was captured by the Comanche in 1836. Um, she married Chief Pina Nakona. And I used to tell students, some other people, it's not Pina Nakona like John Smith or whatever, that's his name, Pina Nakona. It's not, Pina is not his first name. Hi, Pina, how are you doing? Uh, she was married or the wife of Tina Lacona. She gave birth to several children, um, three of whom we know about, and there may have been others. Fauna Parker was born in 1848, or 1850, or 1852, or maybe somewhere in between, because there were no records, no hospital records, no birth records, no census records. He was just, he was just born. And when Cynthia Ann was captured in 1861, by a group of Texas militia and settlers who captured and brought her back, uh, brought her back to Bird, Birdville. Um, this is a big, and you've seen pictures of her. Um, I submit you've never seen this act, but this is a daguerreotype. Before there were photographs, there were daguerreotypes. Um, it's a more primitive, older form. 
but this is what she looked like. She wasn't a beauty by our Hollywood standards of what the Indian last should look like. But this is a woman who lived like a Comanche Indian, and she chewed leather because that's how you soften the leather. She did all the farming and tilling the soil, which is what the women did in the Comanche tribe, and she lived as a Comanche woman. So she's not going to look like uh, somebody who just stepped out of Central Fantasy. But what's interesting about this, this is her signature at the bottom on this computer file. And there's two pictures of her that were taken in 1861 when she came back through Fort Worth and Birdville and went to live with her uncle um, on her uncle's farm. Uh, there are two of them. And one of them shows her nursing a baby. And that one has occasionally been valorized or, or whatever because you can't have a woman nursing a baby a photograph for crying out loud. That you no know, culture, that no class. But the other thing I want you to see about if you've got really good eyes, look at those hands. Look at the size of those hands. The woman could have played basketball and called it a basketball. And I don't mean that irreverently. I just mean one of the things that stands out about Cynthia Ann is the size of her hand. Um, that's why that always struck me. But this is Cynthia Ann, and she was Quana's mother. And when she was captured, Quana wasn't captured, and he went on to lead the resistance to the U.S. Army, to the settlers, until they finally surrendered in 1875. Next picture. <clears throat> This is a picture of a very young quantum, which I have dated. My friend and I, uh, Clara Rubble, um, who is personally much better connected to the Comanche Nation. I just brought that historical interest, and she brought the pictures. We sat down and talked about it. But this is a picture uh, I've dated about 1875, so we just went quantum surrendered. Here he's still wearing his traditional Indian garb. Um, he's very young, although some Sources um, date this picture as 1869. Uh, I think it's after he surrendered in 1875. Well, look at that man. It's a very proud man. His eyes aren't downcast. He doesn't look ashamed. He doesn't look like he's, um, um, doesn't look defeated, doesn't look ashamed. So I think about 1875, one, but dressed in combination of Indian garb and white man's garb. Next picture. This one is in debate. Um, I've had people tell me that there's no way in the world this is Quanta Parker, and Clara Ruddle and I decided we think it is Quanta Parker. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to tell, um, but I think it is. If so, um, notice again, you can't see it as well from back there if you get up close and magnify it. He's got his, his braids, um, he's got those cheekbones, um, he's got a rifle, but notice the horse has a western saddle, a white man's saddle. And I think this would have been taken after he surrendered because when he was running wild as a Comanche leading his Comanche warriors against the U.S. Army and the settler, he didn't ride a western saddle. But here's what the horse does. So I figure somewhere in 1875, 1876, whatever. But again, I showed this picture to people who bow, swear up and down, they're adamant. This is not going up. It can't be. Um, I think so, but open the discussion. Next picture. This is, this is the picture, not your eyes. Your eyes aren't going bad. It's just kind of a blur. We, some of the pictures we got were better. This is Quanta, uh, 1885, and his father-in-law, Yellow Bear. Um, they're posing in a Fort Worth studio, the Fort Worth studio of August Mignon, M-I-G-N-O-N. This is their 1885 visit to Fort Worth. Uh, Yellow Bear uh, is, I think, Quanta is the one standing up, upper left. Yellow Bear, I think, is in the middle, I think. Yellow Bear was one, the story, Yellow Bear and Quanta came to Fort Worth. Um, again, the cattlemen welcomed them. They put him up in the Pickwick Hotel downtown, although he stuck him way back in the back. Um, but they put him up in the hotel. That's a famous story you may have heard about while they were there. Um, Quanta went out for an evening on the town, and Yellow Bear went to bed. And Yellow Bear turned off the light, but didn't turn off the gas. And later, when Quanta came back in, 
and stretched out on the floor of the gas, getting going all night and the next afternoon when they finally went to see what happened to our Indians and opened the door, Yellow Bear was dead and Quan was half dead. Mm -hmm. And imagine how that would have um, gone over in Comanche land up in Oklahoma if Ford had killed Quanta Parker and Yellow Bear. So we doctored him up and sent him home and he forgave us and he came back in the future. Yellow Bear was one of about seven or eight father-in-laws that Quanta had. <laughs> Quanta had seven or eight different wives, which again is besides the fact that he never looked older, is he never sad, he never whatever. Uh, any man who could <laughs> keep seven or eight wives uh, happy or whatever is, is, is an amazing man. Uh, the U.S. government told him he couldn't have seven or eight wives. And that's, a, I say seven or eight, how many were they? Well, it's some, some say seven, some say eight. We've got the names of seven, there may have been an eight. I can't even give you all the names, Clara could. But the U.S. government told him you can't have seven or eight wives. And Quanah said, okay. So from then on, he traveled with one wife and left the others at home. And the wife that he could travel with was Tanarsi, and you'll see her later on. So Yellow Bear is his father-in-law, and it's nice he took his father-in-law with him, but he had about six or seven other father-in-laws he could also have brought with him. But he had a photograph taken in Fort Worth, 1885, and obviously um, before they checked in the hotel, and Yellow Bear went to bed that night, didn't wake up the next morning because he's here in this particular picture. The last thing to think about, and I asked this question, is okay, Quan and Yellow Bear arrive in Fort Worth, right? And it's my time, and Yellow Bear says, I'm going to bed, and Quan says, I'm going to go out to the town. What does a Comanche chief do in the town in Fort Worth? He didn't go to the museum, he didn't go to a movie. Um, I've got a book back from Hellsath Acre. They welcome anybody in Hellsath Acre. I don't mean that as an insult to Quana. I just mean the only color they knew in Hellsath Acre was green, muddy. So maybe he went down there, but we don't know. Move on. This is uh, what I think we think is an 1889 picture of Quana posed with a group of lawmen in Paris, Texas. And again, notice it's Quanta up in the upper right hand corner. Uh, if you've got good eyes or you're close enough, can you see what he's holding? Yes. Holding a six shooter. So it's just interesting. Doesn't that make you wonder why is Quanta Parker, um, Comanche chief, uh, retired, posing with a group of lawmen, all of whom are out, you know, outfitted, uh, armed with teeth? And he's right there with them. See the braids? Can you see the braids? But he's got a six gun in his hand. Uh, did they take him along? Did he sneak in the picture when they weren't looking? I have no idea. He's a very young Juan Barker. Um, but didn't that look kind of like wider a little bit back? It's not. But Lordy, wouldn't that be great if it was? But this again, what's Walvin? Uh, and you can see badges on some of them if you're close enough. Uh, he doesn't have a badge on, but he's posed with them. I think that's just fascinating. Move on. Move on. This is Quanta the businessman and Quanta the traditional guard of Native American. I think about 1890, about 1890. And so if you want to be figuring, best guess on Quanta, if you say 1850, her birthday, you're close enough for government work. And so count forward to 1850, and this is about 1890. Um, the way people aged back then, before you had all the creams and lotions and air conditioning, all that kind of stuff, uh, for a man in his 40s, especially who spent the time riding the open range and living like a Comanche Native American, um, God looks darn good. He looks darn good. Anyway, this was um, taken in a studio, the F.W. Hamilton Studio in Oklahoma City. Uh, it's a cabinet card over here. A Hamilton Studio, a cabinet card. Um, what else, what else, what else? Uh, it was reproduced uh, later by William Lenny and William Sawyers for a series they did on Indian views. And they <laughs> took as many pictures as they could of as many Indians that could get inside the studio for several years. And those cabinet cards, that's a cabinet card, are uh, one of the best collections we have of Native Americans uh, photographed uh, Contemporary, contemporaneously, contemporaneously. And one of the problems was, unlike Quanta, many Native Americans wouldn't go near a camera or a studio. Quanta, um, like I said, never had a camera, he didn't lie. But look at him over there. Not only is he posed, look, he's got his braids on, but look at the hat, got a nice derby hat on, got a nice suit. Can you see what's in his right hand? 
an umbrella. It's an umbrella. Is this not a distinguished gentleman? This this ain't some half wild community. This is a distinguished gentleman. He's got on a hat, a derby hat, and an umbrella. I don't know if the umbrella was just a prop or I could use it, but it's an umbrella. And look at this. About the same time, two different quantities. Two different quantities. Move on to the next one. This one is about 1890 also, a photograph labeled Chief Quanta and his men. Quanta is the one on the left. And again, look at like this for curiosity. Maybe I'm just dreaming it up, but Quanta has very large hands, I think. Uh, larger than a lot of us, the kind of hands that basketball players wish they had. And I always wondered, I told Claire, I wondered, and there's no way to back it up, if this was something he inherited obviously from his mother, remember how large her hands were, uh, and maybe that's uh, a, a sign, a visible symbol of that mother-son relationship, or maybe a lot of horse sweats. I may just be making stuff up. But this is Quanta on the left with two Comanche medicine men, uh, Kwasiya, I'm sure I'm butchering that, and Frank Moita, who's standing. Uh, Quanta in traditional garb, except the fact that he's wearing a military Officer's sash over his left knee. You can't see it unless you're up close. And why would he have a military, U.S. Army military officer's sash over his left knee? I have no idea. Um, he does have a scalp knot, which is barely visible in the back if you're up close enough. And again, it's one of many, many studio photographs taken of Quanta. Uh, in this case, uh, top two of his medicine men, as they were called by whites, in the city with him. Move on. This is Quanta, about 1891, posed in front of the teepee where he lived, um, even if he came in the reservation. He said that he lived in a teepee until building Star House in 1890. And the Star House was a large uh, white man's, almost a mansion, but a very large, nice house that he built in, how do you pronounce it? Cash, H, Cash, C A C H E, Cash, Oklahoma. Uh, it's still there. Sadly, it's falling apart. Uh, Oklahoma has not quite gotten up the, the whatever to preserve this house. It needs to be preserved. It's called Star House because it was a big, giant star on the roof. Uh, what the star stood for, why he wanted it, I have no idea. Um, but the house is barely being held together because they just haven't invested the money to try to save it. But he kept the TP up even after he moved in the Star House. And he did publicity shots in front of the TP. Look what he's got in his hand. Bow and arrow. He didn't hunt or fight with bow and arrows anymore. It's a publicity shot. This is Quanta, the Comanche chief, posed in the Comanche headdress in front of a TV wearing traditional clothes with a bow and arrow. Uh, this is posed for publicity. This is not the way he fought the U.S. Army and others. He carried a rifle uh, and not didn't wear a headdress when he's galloping around. Move on to the next one. This is Quanta. I love this picture. Um, you got to watch all these pictures. You got to get up close. And again, the quality of the photograph, A, maybe wasn't the best when it was taken, and also it has faded as age and ill treatment have affected it over the years. But this is Quanta, seated in his bedroom at Star House. In his bedroom at Star House. I don't know how good your eyes are. But see that portrait by his left shoulder? Can you see what that is? Cynthia. That's his mother and sister, uh, Prairie Flower, I think was the name, translated name, Prairie Flower. And this is the photograph that shows her nursing Prairie Flower. And I just think that's interesting. And he's posed there with it. And notice who's in the background over his right shoulder. Jesus. This is Jesus Christ. It just makes you know how to play the audience. Jesus Christ over here. Your mom over here. This man was doing it in a lot of ways. Anyway, here he posed in his port in his home at sorry. Next picture. This was taken in March of 1894 um, at the Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And Quanta was visiting with two of his wives, uh, Tonarsi and Nada. And they were part of a Comanche and Kiowa delegation, which went to the school. Where's my name myself? Which went to the school um, which went to the school um, to 
top to the students there. Uh, Carlisle, most of us never heard of the Indian School of Carlisle until we saw the movie about Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe went to the Carlisle School and others went. It was the only place as a Native American Indian who could go to get a higher education. Uh, the first place is Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And along with Quanah and two of his wives, and I'm not sure which wife is which, um, one of them is sitting over there on his shoulder, one of them is down at his knees. Notice they're all dressed how? Yeah. Yeah. White man's garb. All of them dressed in white man's garb. Uh, why? Because Carlisle's school was dedicated to transforming Indians into white people. Maybe you can't change your color skin, but you change your culture. And so if you were a student in Carlisle, you never wore Indian garb. And if the Kiowa Comanche delegation is going to visit the Indians, they would be expected also to dress that way. So there's one of the two of his wives. Move on to the next picture. No. I thought I would. Point of now. Okay. Next, next. Now, yeah, can you click next? Click on next. Top one. Yeah. There you go. Click it. Click on that. See what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> 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 Oh, thank you. Yay. Don't go far. Uh, this is Juana and what are referred to in the description as his fellow committee men of the Comanche Nation. They're standing in a wagon for un some unknown reason. It was taken in port. Escaped. <laughs> I didn't do anything. <laughs> Okay, if you guys want me to shut up and sit down, I'd just say something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Quick, 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 quick. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Watch where that name goes. Uh, <laughs> can we go back to this one right here? Don't touch anything. This one. Quanah uh, and his committee men, as they were called, of the Comanche Nation standing on a wagon in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. I think it was taken about 1895. But notice the group dynamic. Look at the group dynamic. Who's standing in the front of the wagon? That's Quanah. Who's the head man? Who's the big poncho? Who's the big potato? Who's the big guy? Um, the rest of them are maybe standing or sitting, but they're all behind it. The man in the driver's seat, literally, was quite a part of what they were committing men of, what they were doing. The uh, picture doesn't say, just a picture. Move on to the next one. No smiles. Oh, no, 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 no. So the Indians never, actually, nobody used to smile uh, <laughs> when he took pictures. I don't think that is the thing. Nobody smiles, partly because they took time to take a picture, and partly because a lot of people had bad teeth. And if it takes time to get a picture, get it all set up, you sit there going, what's wrong with you, Indian? Of course, you had bad taste, so nobody smiled in the old pictures. The Indians even less so. Um, I think we missed. Can you go back? Yeah, that, that is the one. Yes. That's correct. Go back go again. Back. That's where you want to be. That's the next one. Okay, yeah, go, yeah now go forward one. This one. Okay, okay. Make it, make it, make it. Um, this is Quana and Tanarsi as part of an Indian delegation to Washington, D.C. Uh, 1897, Quana is at the far left. Tanarsi is sitting down at his, beside him, at his left shoulder. That's Tanarsi, who some say was his favorite wife. She traveled the most with him, but, uh, you know, you don't have any favorite wives anymore and you have favorite children if you're smart, I don't think. <laughs> anyway, it's a candid photograph. With what fascinates me is that very large, unidentified white woman back in the background. Now, this is taken to Washington, D.C. Um, you've got the Indians in the front, Native Americans, Comanche, Kiowa. You've got all these white guys in suits in the back, and you've got a very large woman looking very stern in the back. Don't you? Who is she? How'd she get the picture? Was she somebody's wife? Did she stumble the picture by accident? Was she related to the photographer? No idea. No idea. Move on to the next one. 
This is Quanah relaxing in his office at Star House. He's not old, but he's not young either. You can't tell much because of the quality of the picture. Um, we dated it about 1897 to 1900. Uh, you can date the picture uh, most accurately by the chromo lithograph on the wall behind him. And the chromo lithograph, which this is a blow up of another image of it, another, another view of it, was a picture Custer's Last Fight by Otto F. Becker. Uh, it was produced by the Anheuser Busch Company, given out along with its beer, uh, starting in 1896. So the chromo lithograph, which is another fancy word for a large poster, wasn't produced until 1896. So Quanta didn't have the picture then from his wall. But think about that. The title of the picture is Custer's Last Spike. It's on Quanta's wall. Does that guy not have an ironic sense of humor? I mean, just yeah. th think about that. Think about what he was thinking when he put that up. He looks very relaxed. His office looks uh, almost as bad as my office. But uh, this was his office at Starhouse. Move on to the next one. Okay, in 1905, March of 1905, Quana and some other uh, Native American chiefs went to Washington, D.C. for Theodore Roosevelt's inauguration. It was Roosevelt that insisted they be there. And this group of, of men on horseback on the right is uh, Quana and some other chiefs who were identified. Quana is, uh, well, let me see, I'm not sure. I think Quan is the one in the middle of the white horse, I think. I haven't looked at this in a while. Um, I have no idea who the others were, but this is at the same time he was at Washington, he was taken into school to be a headdress. And again, there's a debate of whether this is really Quan, but Lordy, look at the headdress. Look at the headdress. Um, I think it was taken at the same time by the same photographer at the same studio. Um, why? It was because I think so. Claire and I think so. But it's certainly dramatic looking. And of course, in their poses, that doesn't look like Quan. I don't think they is. You have to decide. Next picture. This is Quan Parker, a star of stage, screen, and battlefield, 1907. Um, he was one of the stars of a genuine uh, film, a movie, an uh, outlaw lawman movie with such celebrities as Al Jennings, Bill Tillman, Frank Canton, and Hep Thomas. It was a silent western. 1908, the bank robbery released in 1908, and that's Quan on the white horse in the front. Um, I don't know that a full copy of the movie exists. Again, it's a 1908 film, but I do think it's interesting that Quan managed to get into the film and it's front and center in this shot right here, 1908. And since it's a bank robbery picture, we've got the bank there behind it in the picture. Move on, next picture. Can I ask you a question? Yes, by all means. How did the other wives feel about Cynthia? Uh, John, good question. Uh, again, nobody, she didn't interview Native Americans' wives and ask them how they felt about anything. Um, they were in the background. And so I'm not sure that they would have uh, had an opinion or been allowed to have an opinion. Uh, they never met Cynthia Ann. Uh, Cynthia Ann eventually died uh, when I was growing up, we said she died of a broken heart, but she just didn't take the white civilization again. And when she was being whiteified and trying to transfer back into a white woman, uh, 1836 to 1861, how many years is that? That's how many years she lived as a Comanche. She was about 12 years old. So she was at, I'm answering your question in a rambling way. But so while she was doing all that, he was um, on the warpath, fighting. So they never got together and she died. Now later on, he spoke of her often. Um, he arranged eventually to have her body moved up to Oklahoma and requested when he died to be buried beside her. But your question, how did the, how did the wives feel? Um, there's no record anybody ever asked. And I think that both the wife and Juana would have taken tremendous exception to be questioned about something like that. This is Quanta's wife, I mean, Quanta's mother, and he always spoke of her reverently. And what wife is gonna say, I am the mother of a stupid white woman. It's just, you gotta kinda figure that they wouldn't say anything negative. Um, 
This is about uh, 1909, Corner Parker, the family man. He's posed uh, with Tanarsi. Again, that's Tanarsi beside him, who I think was his favorite watch. He simply traveled with him for anybody else. But on the front porch of Star House. And over there on the side, uh, the other picture is five of Juan's children, um, which he had. Not every one of his wives bore children. At least three or four of his wives, we know, bore children. These are five of those children by various wives, which didn't bother anybody except the white government, the white preachers. It didn't seem to bother the Native American Navy. But I want you to look at there. I want you to think about it, though. This is a man, a Comanche chief, a man's man, if you will, a traditional patriarchal male dominant culture, but he's standing on the front porch of his house, his house, beside who? His wife. Think about that. Think about that. This is a man who obviously wasn't threatened by getting photographed with his wife. And most of you are thinking, what? My husband wouldn't be threatened, would you, honey? <laughs> or I would never be threatened by posting with my wife. But you were a Comanche Indian raised in a different culture. So just look at it and think about it. Um, she looks right at the mirror, actually. I mean, she's not standing there like that. But um, you can tell who the big dog is and the chief is, and that's fine. But his children over there, uh, who were their mothers, uh, he knew. But that has to come down to us. Move on to the next one. Move on to the next one. This is, I love this picture. This is a young Kwani with another one of his wives. Not sure which wife this was. This is not Tanarsi. If you went back and forth from these last two, you would see this is not Tanarsi. This is a very good looking woman. But look at, look at her face. Look at the expression on her face. Is she not shy or reluctant to be there? Um, this is not her idea of a fun time. Um, the man who looks casual got his gun there and just reared back looking at his biggest life is Kwani. Well, he's got this wife beside him who, to me, looks like she'd rather be any place else in the world besides posting for the camera. But he got also, I have to admit, I think mean, he's a good looking woman. Um, by any standard, wife, Native American, whatever, plus, and I don't know how Comanche judge good looking. I think they're more practical. But, got his weapon. Quanta never posed, or seldom posed in Indian Yard without a weapon either because it was natural or because it was part of the act, part of the publicity. Next picture, next picture, we're getting there. Uh, <laughs> this is Quanta posed with Tom Burnett. And Tom Burnett was the, paddle, was the son of Paddle Baron Burt Burnett, who has all sorts of stuff named after him in Fort Worth. Foundations, buildings, streets, everything. This is Tom Burnett, the son that Burt Burnett uh, eventually denied and uh, didn't particularly like it, wasn't close to him. And Tom Burnett uh, ran part of the ranch up in North Texas, up in the Panhandle. There's a point to the story, but I want you to look at Tom Burnett. Tom Burnett struck up a relationship with the Comanche Indian woman across the river in the reservation, and he would visit her, and uh, visit her fairly often. And I got some letters that were in a legal suit that showed one time he visited her and bestowed upon her very own tent, her very own tent. So I guess they had a place to stay when he visited. Think about that. But um, eventually, the reason I bring that out is eventually um, their offspring, a daughter they had years later, wound up suing the Burnett family. Tom Burnett died in 1935, and this offspring of Tom Burnett and this Indian, whatever you want to call her, wasn't his wife, concubine, mistress, whatever, um, wound up living in Washington state and sued the family. The support to the story. Um, those documents wound up in a legal brief, which for some reason wound up at the Fort Worth Library uh, by the state, because law firms don't put their legal papers for a case uh, on public display in the library. And I discovered it years and years and years ago and wrote the story about Tom Burnett. The point of the story being that she sued the Burnett family. Now, Tom was dead. Burke Burnett was dead. He had died. But Ann Burnett was alive and had every lawyer in the world on her side. And the Burnett lawyers ripped the daughter to shreds. They got her in the stand. They brought in all these native, these other Indians to say she was a whore and she slept with anybody and uh, whatever, just like her mother and blah, 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 blah. And Tom Burnett 
They didn't know who Tom Burnett. And they just ripped it. She had one poor little lawyer who was her lawyer, and then she lost very, very badly. And the last part of the story, then, if you're wondering why I don't move along, is because I wrote this story up based on these legal papers and submitted it to Wild West magazine. And Wild West planned to publish it. And then I made the mistake of sending a complimentary copy to the Burnett family <laughs> building downtown, thinking that they would appreciate an advanced copy. And their lawyers, if you know the name Dee Kelly, uh, their lawyers contacted the Wild West magazine and threatened in very crude language what they were going to do to the editor and publisher at Wild West if they dared publish this. And Wild West threw up their skirt and said, we surrender and we'll edit out anything you want to edit out. And so it wound up edited way, way down. But it didn't get published. It edited way, way down. And the end of the story, Dee Kelly initially called me and said they wanted to know, Burnett and wanted to know where the hell these papers came from. And I said, you know, if you'll ask Ann Burnett, but if, if you'll ask her to call me and ask me, I'll be glad to show them where they are, take her to them, put them in her hands or whatever. But this threatening stuff, this making threats and calling me names and Telling them I won't even tell you the language. When you want a lawyer, you want a, a, a junkyard dog lawyer. And Dee Kelly was an outstanding lawyer uh, for the family. I said, when you threaten me and my publisher and all this kind of stuff, I'm not going to give you all a slot. But if she'll call and ask, and he laughs, and yeah, okay, I'm up. So that's Tom Burnett, the source of all this trouble later that came up with illegitimate children and lawsuits and all that kind of stuff. Um, standing beside Juan of Harper, which has to be amazingly ironic. Move on to the next one. Move on to the next one. Juan, um, his image and name were well enough known that uh, he was very useful for publicity, for advertising. His, his classic features, uh, promotional purposes, in this case, the Quanta Route, a Texas Short Line Railroad, 1910 Hardman, the Quanta Route Day, um, was a way of promoting. And I submit to you, there was not a single other Native American chief that you ever heard of, anybody ever heard of, who loaned their name, their picture, their image to promoting railroads across the West. But Quanta did. Quanta's a sharp fellow. Uh, and then we'll leave that to move on. There's a story behind that, and we'll move on because of time. This is Quanta, uh, an older Quanta, I think about 1910, posed on the Matador Ranch. It's a very rare, candid photograph. Uh, he's not dressed up in a warrior garb. Uh, a lot of it, he's got his thumbs looking at his pants. He's got a little bit of a tummy. You see, he's got a little bit of a Look at his face up. Look at his face. I mean, this is, he doesn't look like a tired old man. I just add up the years and then figure out how he lived his life. But this is, a, like I said, a candid photo. Um, his thumbs casually hooked, um, but still proud and still erect and still with the same brains. Move on next. This is about 1910, uh, a little later, I think 1910. This is an elderly Weatherby Quanta not long before his death. He's about 65 or 66 years old here, but still very recognizable as a fierce warrior chief who once terrorized white Texans. This was taken in the White Photography Studio in Lawton, Oklahoma. Uh, he died February 23rd. 1911 at Star House. This was taken only a few months before his death, but even so, what? The braids, uh, the cheekbones, uh, he still got all his hair, which puts him way ahead of me, uh, and a lot of us. Uh, he's proud, uh, erect, and looking right at the camera, as fierce as he was 30 or 40 years before he was terrorized by Sedlitz. Move on, last one. What was the yeah. jewelry? Well, my neck was that. Oh, well, can you go back? Then the piano window. The sunburst, the sunburst pen here um, was something that shows up in a lot of his pictures. Um, Claire, on my sidekick partner, or whatever, knows a lot more about the pen. Um, the story of that sunburst pen came down from the family. Uh, I'm not sure where he got it or when he began wearing it. But if you look at a lot of his photographs up close, the ones where he's dressed, especially in the businessman suit, um, he's got that wearing. So it must have been something to him. But your question of where did it come from, why did he wear it, no idea, no idea. But again, the family, Clara is in contact with the family. And they tell her stories which are basically unprovable. 
but they have come down through the families because you give somebody five, six, eight, ten children, and then they have children, and they have children. There's a lot of Parkers left around. Move on, move on. This is um, the last one you'll be glad to know. Uh, this is Lyle Tope, who is on the left, and Tanarsi on the right, and they are posed at Pana's first grave site, where he's first buried, Post Oak Indian Missionary Cemetery, Indian Homa, India, Homa, Oklahoma. The headstone has his birthday as 1852. Um, I'm not sure. There's really no way to prove that. Somebody told the people that made the headstone, it was 1852, and that went off the headstone. But this is not the final resting place of Juana. Eventually, when the um, Air Force puts in a runway and a base and takes up some of this land where a lot of these people were buried, um, Juana had to be moved. He wound up buried beside his mother um, because he moved his mother from where she was buried in East Texas. He moved her to Oklahoma. Um, after he was moved, he wound up uh, beside her, and they are beside each other now. But it took years to get there, and it took the U.S. Air Force putting in a runway and uh, I forget which whichever base is near Lawton, Oklahoma. Um, which is, is it Tinker? Maybe Tinker. I'm not sure which one is there. Fort Sill. Fort Sill. Is it Fort Sill? Not a mistake. Fort Sill. But uh, when the Army wanted land, they don't ask whether Indians buried here or not. Not back then, not back in the 1950s. And when he was moved, it was the 1950s. And uh, obviously, we have a different standard now. Yeah. Is that his wife? This is both of them. I mean, this is two of them. Two of them. Oh, Tope. Tope on the left, Tanarsi on the right. Tope on the left, Tanarsi on the right. Um, uh, again, the stories, each one had their own story. That lawsuit I told you about, and I'll, I'll quit here and if you have questions or, uh, or whatever, but that lawsuit I told you about, one of the neat things about the lawsuit is the law firm, um, Kathy Hanger was the law firm of the Burnett family. And the law firm um, put together a whole file. You know, law firms, when you're in a lawsuit thing, you, set, you gather all the material you can. Um, they can't tell what you need to destroy the other side. But they gathered the names of all his direct relatives that they could identify. And when Claire was looking at this, she was saying, I remember the family talking about this one, talking about this one. But it's this whole list of Comanche names of people that what they did is interview various people and saying, who are, who are his wives, who are his children, you name them. And that's the only list I've ever seen uh, of his family, his direct descendants, his wife and children. And again, it was gathered, though, by Canty Hanger Law Firm, not out of historical interest, but so they could use the information against this woman <laughs> that was suing the Burnett family. And Canty Hanger still exists, and the Kelly son is still a lawyer, and if you need a junkyard dog lawyer to defend you, by God, I think that law firm can still do the job. Uh, this is the end. If you've got a question, I'll be glad to answer them. If not, I will turn it back over to whoever's in charge. Yes, ma'am. What did he die of? He looked pretty healthy. Um, I, to say old age sounds uh, sarcastic. I'm not sure what he died of. Uh, there are so many illnesses back in the old days that could take somebody away without a fancy name. If you're wondering, was it cancer? Was it heart failure? Was it a brain tumor? Um, I don't know. No, no, okay. Are you aware that his great great grandson lives in Lance Tomacara? Lance Tomacara, yeah. And uh, Lance and then Lance's uh, father, but the, the family. And I don't know Lance personally, but years, a few years ago, when the interest renewed, uh, Lance Tomacara um, and his father, too, I think was a lot, became rock stars because here was this Native American person. And this whole, the local Comanche in the Dallas Fort Worth area, the local Comanche tribal group, uh, really took off a few years ago. He was kind of the acknowledged leader. Um, I don't know him personally, but I knew he lived in the area. I do know him. You do know him? When they, did, when they dedicated the Ripley Arnold statue in 2012, down there behind what's now the Trinity River campus. When they dedicated the statue, uh, they had Comanche Indian come in and bless the soil, bless the ground. And I wonder, didn't that strike you as odd? <laughs> because Ripley Arnold was here 
to keep the Indians at bay, not to defend and protect them, whatever. He was an Indian fighter, really in basic terms, and yet the city and county invited in the Comanche to bless the soil around where the monument was. But I just found that tremendously ironic. Not everybody asked for my opinion, but I thought it was so funny. Other question, just now. When I was in the seventh grade, there was a girl named Sandy Parker who was related to him that was in my class. I'm not avoiding about her. But you never mentioned about the Paladero situation with him. Uh, the, the Paladero can you, you mean the, the, the fights he had, the, 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 um, the two battles? Yeah, we can also. The Dobie, the Dobie Walls battle, the Dobie Walls 1 and 2? No. Are, are Paladero Canyon, you mean as far as, um, what was his name that I'll play that? Dobie Walls was, that was Buffalo Hunters. The battle in Paladero Canyon is when McKenzie snuck in there and jumped him. He got all the horses and shot. And I didn't say anything about it because without doing my homework, I don't know anything about it really, to be able to say. Um, there's some books published on several recent biographies. And it talks about one of them that I've taken an issue with the author. It says that Quan was never defeated. That's not true. Uh, Adobe Walls was a defeat. The Comanche wound up retreating. And the author no longer speaks to me because I thought him and said, but what about Adobe Walls? But um, Quan has become an iconic figure that represents all of this noble and wonderful about Native Americans. And that's why he has a statue in the stockyards. And please understand, I'm not tearing him down. I'm not saying he wasn't a wonderful chief. But we grab on to somebody like this and we elevate them because we need somebody that we as the majority can admire and respect and hold up um, as heroic, as iconic. And Connor Parker fits that. Um, a man, quite often he's been a man of the foot in two worlds in two civilizations, and he was definitely that. So please don't walk out of here thinking that Seltzer insulted Parker family and Quanta, whatever. I might insult D. Kelly, but I would never insult Quanta Parker and the Parker family. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. With the Peace Circle, one of the ones that did the research, her father's school budget in it, and she had, I think it was a Cherokee, come in and do the blessing of the statues, and then there was a guy with the uh, Indian drum who was it? I mean, everything was really, I thought, done. Tastefully. Yeah. Where Respectfully. Respectfully. And this is certainly. But think about it. Hang on a thing. Just within our little room here, just our little family here, how would your parents, grandparents have reacted to putting up a statue to Major Ripley Army and inviting the Indians to come in and bless the soil? Um, I don't think most of our parents, grandparents would have thought that was really made any sense, but yet we do it, and we do it for a reason. And we can uh, debate, discuss, good reasons, bad reasons, whatever, but just think about that. A lot of fear. There, there, there is a lot of fear to it. Um, when the mayor of Fort Worth and the uh, uh, representative uh, invited the Comanche Nation, and Lance Tamakara was part of that, to come and bless the soil. It was this great reverent event. We all paused, we all bowed our heads, and we all were very respectful while they did the thing. And I was, I couldn't help but think that most of these people who were doing this, and again, I don't know Lance Tamakara personally, but most of them, until very, very recently, had never done any kind of a Comanche ritual ceremony and didn't know it because they were raised away from the traditional rituals. But when it becomes the end thing, or a uh, directing, then they acquire this ability to do these ritual advances that probably hadn't been done in generations. And I'm just, I'm just guessing. I'm just, I'm just guessing. I don't know. But I just think I do think it's interesting that um, your grandparents, great grandparents, maybe even your parents would have thought that was just weirdest heck to have them there blessing the soil around these things, including Major Ripley Arnold statue. Other questions? Have any questions? Yes, ma'am. I just had a comment. When these statues were being carved and everything, the, the direct descendants or there were approvals on our statues here at the Peace Circle from, you know, as close as we could get to that. So they, they said, yes, this is a, a representation of our tribe, of our family. Uh, direct descendants. So 
uh, when the time came and all of these were dedicated, that day of, of everyone that was there, it was very peaceful, it was very respectful, it was honoring from Great Pond to the Indians and back and forth. And I mentioned that to the mayor, how the whole weekend was just, it was just really very respectful and very, uh, you know, honoring to the Indians. And uh, our president of the Historical Society, Doug Odell, said that, I believe it was the Apache Indian, our representative, came to her with tears in his eyes, and he said, no one has ever recognized my people like you have done. And so it was just, it was a really, you know, it just felt really good. That whole weekend was just. Um, I wouldn't hear about it. Sure was, and please, I'm not bad mouthing oh, my piece. Oh, I'm not. No, 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 no. I don't mean it that way. I'm just saying this is what happened that day. One of the comment to the news media came to Bill Tate, our mayor, and uh, said, uh, "You know that uh, Sam Houston had slaves," and he told he told them, he said, "That's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about the peace circle." So yeah, he said, "I'm the American history. You could afford him back in the day. Had a slave, or two, or three, or four, or five. I don't know how we deal with that or handle that. I understand the resentment of people who are descended, but Lordy, anybody, if you're a white person, have enough money and live in the South, or even if you lived up north, you could afford a slave. You had a slave." You might treat him good, you might treat him badly, but Lordy, that was, that was just natural. And that there was, were a lot of black people who had slaves in South Carolina. And, and, and the, Cherokee, the Cherokee Indians, some of them owned slaves. So it wasn't just, so anyway, but the, um, one of the problems, one of the problems with Native American history, which is a similar problem to black history, is that there's very, very, very hardly any records uh, because the people who were those people uh, didn't read and write, didn't have archives, didn't have museums, didn't have um, historical collections. So the history of both African Americans and Native Americans is almost entirely oral history. And the problem with oral history is, is it passed down, the passed down, the passed down, the passed down. The problem with oral history, you ever play the game telephone? <laughs> you start around the circle. What happens to the time it gets on the circle back to where it started? What happens to the story? Distorted change. It ain't the same, ain't the same story. And so the problem with dealing with oral history is how does it change over the generations? And think about you. Think about the history, of your, your family history stories you heard growing up. How many of those do you remember word for word, for sentence for sentence, of just who aunt and uncle did, and what they did, and grandma and grandpa, and where they moved, and who they did, and all this kind of stuff? And how many of it is kind of a few details you remember, and you fill in the rest with kind of whatever? God, it's not a joke. You remember the punchline, but you don't remember the joke, but you kind of make it up to get the punchline. And so we create stories of our family histories because you can't remember it all. But you always say, beats me. I don't know what they did or who they did. So oral history, that's a problem with Native American history. And so when you say this is accurate, it's accurate according to a certain oral tradition and them. But there's other oral traditions the same thing. Last thing, I'll shut up and sit down so we can do other stuff. What I want you to do, I want you to all rush back here and buy books. <laughs> if I talk you to sleep, you won't do that. But, uh, in one of my books, I wrote back, there's a chapter on Quantum Park before I did this. So uh, Fort Worth Characters book came out years ago. And one of the men I talked to was a self-styled representative of the Comanche Nation of Oklahoma, Bill something or other. Bill was half German and half Comanche. Um, but Bill was a self-appointed spokesman for the Comanche Nation. And I learned later that a lot of the Comanche can't stand it. Don't believe he knows anything, don't want to be a spokesman, don't consider him anything. But at the time, I was saying, you know, you know, tell me what you know, what you've heard, all this kind of stuff. And then when the book manuscript got to the publisher, and uh, again, he uh, made a mistake of sending him a copy of the chapter, and he threatened to see the publisher. He said, this is all wrong. Everything you said about Quan is wrong. I said, well, I have my citations, newspapers and stories where I got my stuff. Where does your stuff come from? It, it might as well. And he says, I swear, he says, I'm Comanche. <laughs> and I was fed up at that point because I'm been chewing on my ass. I said, no, Bill, you're half Comanche, so your story's half right. <laughs> 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 but, 
But that way, the point being that all the Canadians don't necessarily speak with one language, more than all African Americans speak with one voice about all agreeing on whatever, any more than all of us white people all have the same agreement on how history happened and who did what. We. So, with that note, uh, we turn back to whoever, and hopefully on the way out or whenever you stop back here and visit the table, at least look, I think you feel good about what. Rick, on uh, the first, second Saturday of every uh, month, he has a tour of Fort Worth, a walking tour of Fort Worth, and we have an a honorary. Oh, thank you. I, 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 I experience uh, yeah, the second Saturday of the month, we'll meet at the TNP railroad station downtown. We meet around the back behind the station. Uh, we have a different topic every walking tour. At Saturday, starts at 9 o'clock. And we walk until about 11 o'clock or until you get tired, say I've had enough, and you, you walk away. But uh, coming up in October, um, coming up in November, we're going to do the JFK tour. John F. Kennedy was in Fort Worth twice, 1960 and obviously 1963. We'll do that. In December is a church tour, the historic downtown churches. So if you like a walking tour now, if you're looking for a segue, we don't do segues. We walk. <laughs> if you're looking for a walking tour, come join us on uh, Boston. Thank you.